Hello dear brothers and sisters. We are going to start a series of programs today that will include individual Gospels. We will go through each individual Gospel from the beginning to the end, slowly, uh, one small paragraph at a time, and try to reveal the treasures of the biblical stories that we find in the Gospels of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today, we will talk about the Bible itself for a few minutes to have an overview and general understanding what Bible is. Sometimes we learn about the Bible from sources that either are not competent in what their knowledge is about the Bible or they have alternate motivations and agendas to present what the Bible is. I would like to speak about the Bible from the perspective of the Orthodox Church because the Orthodox Church being the most ancient church next to the Catholic and a few other Oriental churches has kept the Bible throughout the centuries in the center of its attention and has preserved the Bible for us today. If it was not for the historical churches, we would not have the Bible today as it is. And so I would like to present to you the perspective of the Orthodox Church towards the Bible. The Bible obviously is in the center of the Orthodox Church, in the center of the attention of the Orthodox Church. We keep the Bible on the holy altar at all times. More clearly, the New Testament, uh, the New Testament readings of the year are placed on the altar, which is the center of the liturgical life of the Orthodox Church. The Bible, the, the New Testament is venerated, is taken very seriously and with awe. And it's read uh, aloud in the church, it's read standing up, and when it's read, everyone stands up. So these are small nuances of the approach of the Orthodox Church, what and how we understand the Bible is for us as Orthodox. The biblical readings, the New Testament readings are read throughout the year and it covers most of the New Testament. So the Bible itself, as we have today, sometimes we think that it all of a sudden appeared in the midst of the congregations that we have today. However, when we look historically, the formation of the Bible itself, the formation of the New Testament specifically, we see that it was a long process. And it was not that Jesus came into this world and he sat down and wrote the Gospels, or he lived the life and then he wrote an autobiography and left it for us so that we know what happened and what he did. But the Bible, the Gospels themselves, formed throughout the centuries into one book that we call today a Bible. And in the earlier, very early stages of Christianity, which we call the apostolic time, there was actually no need for any books except the scriptures which will called scriptures, were the Old Testament scrolls that were available to many people in synagogues and later on in the Christian circles, that scriptures were read. Those were not New Testament stories or life about Jesus Christ, but they were mostly Old Testament scrolls. However, even at that time, the Old Testament had had not formed into a canon, what we call a canon, a rule, into a one book that was beginning from one place and ending in one place and there were only certain books in it. We have the formation of the canon of the Old Testament throughout the centuries. It goes all the way to the sixth century to be finalized and to be decided that this is it and we don't and we cannot change it one way or the other. On the other hand, there were many oral stories that were told. 
the apostles, as we know from the stories of the New Testament, were not necessarily scholars. They were actually illiterate men. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors who, by memory, told the stories of Christ. The other reason why we would not have written form of the New Testament is that in the first century, second century Christianity, all of the Christians were expecting Christ to come at any time and there was no need for a written form of the New Testament. Only in the beginning of the second century, while the apostles started to die and the church realized that these oral stories are becoming more and more distorted as they go from one church to another, they demanded or they started thinking of writing them down so that they were on a parchment so that they could be read to avoid the distortion of the stories. And only then, in the beginning of the second century, that the stories started to be collected together and some churches had more stories than other churches and eventually they were brought together into one book and to create a comprehensive story, story of Jesus. And only after that, the Old Testament was combined into one canon, into one book. So then later, they were combined together into one book, what we call today a Bible. So the very important point here is that sometimes we think that the churches begin from the Bible. You have a book, it's an instruction book, you read that book, and then you form a community, and everything is based on the Bible, and it's okay. However, as we see in the early church, the Bible itself is the product, the fruit of the church. So church pre-exists, predates the Bible. As I said, the stories, the oral stories were in the church, but we did not have scriptures as we have today in our pews, in our altars, in, uh, in our homes, on our shelves, to go and open it. In order to be able to hear the gospel, we would go only to the, to, to the community where there was somebody who knew all these stories and they would tell them orally. And we would hear and that's how we would learn uh, the stories of Jesus. Or, for that matter, the scrolls that they had from the Old Testament, they would be read and they would be heard as well. The other factor is that there was no print. So the parchments were copied slowly by hand and not everyone could have Bibles in their homes. I would say that very rare, very wealthy people would be able to afford to have all the scrolls that contain the stories of the Old and New Testament in their homes. Those mostly were kept in monasteries who copied and multiplied the parchments and in churches where they were read. And so the tradition was oral. Everything was handed down from person to person. And that was the most effective way. Because when we open the Bible and we read the Bible, we think that it's an instruction book and we can follow it and we will get into the heaven. That is false understanding. One of the patriarchs of the Armenian church, a recent one that I had the blessing to be in the seminary when he was a patriarch, Gargin the first would used to tell us as students that the Bible is not a book. Bible is a library. And in order to be able to navigate through that library, you need a guide. And in order to be able to understand what's in the Bible, like it says in the Acts of the Apostles, how would I understand if I did not have anybody to explain it to me? 
So there are two important processes happening. One is to have a guide to go through the books, through the books of this enormous library that is contained into one book, and also to have someone to explain what is the message of the gospel. Because the message of the gospel still remains in the larger circle of the church. The church has the message, the explanation of the Bible. Today, we have many other forms of explanations. Today, we have scholarly branches that explain the Bible from different perspectives, linguistic, historical, archaeological, and all other ways that the Bible has been explained by the modern scholars. But there is only one important form of explanation of the Bible that is necessary uh, for us as human persons. And that hint for that kind of explanation we find in the Gospels itself. We find in specifically in John's Gospel where John says that Jesus did many other things but if we had written all of them there would not be room in this world. The world being so small at that time of, or the understanding of the world in the Mediterranean area was considered the world. Uh, John thinks that Jesus did so much that it would be impossible even to write it down. However, he says, we are writing down only things that are necessary for your salvation. So if we look at the Bible from any other perspective than that, we are wasting our time that we are playing with the Bible instead of using it as a tool of our salvation. And Jesus and John the Baptist will confirm this. When John came to baptize in the Jordan River, he declared that the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. And when Jesus preached, it says in the Gospels that he preached the gospel of repentance and he told his disciples to go and preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and that everyone should be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and be included and shown the entrance to the kingdom of God. So in that matter, the reason that we have the Bibles today in our churches is only one. That is our salvation. That is a connecting link between us and the apostles. And that is why the traditional churches call themselves apostolic churches. That is why the traditional churches call themselves orthodox churches. I would like to concentrate on those two terms before we enter into the text of the Bible itself. Apostolicness of the church is important because we have no break between us and the apostles. There is a flowing continuity from Christ to his apostles and from the apostles through the saints, through the fathers, through the apostolic fathers and fathers who followed them, all the way through the hierarchs and patriarchs of the church, all the way to us. And that continuity is very important because then we have the continuity of the message that was given by the apostles from Jesus Christ to us where we can follow and go back to that original understanding of the necessity of the incarnation of the birth of Jesus Christ into this world, his preaching, his teaching, his healing and after at the end his crucifixion and resurrection and the meaning and the importance of those events in the New Testament. Otherwise, if we read it as a fiction book, as we read it as a book of instruction, we may go astray. We may not reach the destination that we are aiming for. So this is just a beginning of to understanding what the Bible is and why are we studying it. As we go on, we will go deeper into every single story 
We will go for one passage, one little paragraph at a time, and we will dive deep into every nuance of uh, that paragraph, and we will find out treasures for us that will lead us to understand better our lives, we understand better our past, and build a better future. Because the Church teaches us that we are to live in eternity. We are entering into eternal life as we open the Bible. Because it is the message of the Kingdom of God. It is uh, the tool of our salvation. It's going to lead us, it's our guide to eternal life. So we are going to learn from the past. We're going to build a beautiful present so that our future will be in the kingdom of God at all times as we were living in the eternal life. So today we concentrated on the Bible itself, how it formed, very briefly, why it is important that we follow the Bible but within the tradition of the larger church because the Bible is the fruit of the church. The church is not the fruit of the Bible itself, but God has called humanity. Christ has come into this world and called disciples to Himself, and He has formed the community before even uh, the written form of the New Testament was available and presented. And only after the communities and churches were formed that the Bible and the New Testament specifically was formed as a future guidance after the death of the disciples of Jesus Christ. And the third important thing that I would like to repeat for you today is that we are going to study the Bible in sequence. We're going to start with Mark's Gospel. That is a very short Gospel and very to the point and it was the earliest, the first one that was written uh, by Mark. We'll talk about Mark a little bit next time. We'll start with that short Gospel and then later on, God willing, we'll expand to the other Gospels. We'll find relationship between this and the other Gospels of Synoptics and this and the other Gospel of John that is not a Synoptic Gospel. We'll talk about this later. As of today, uh, thank you very much for paying attention and follow us every day. We will uh, go through the Gospels and we'll have uh, a guidance of understanding and guidance of entering into the eternal life, into the Kingdom of God. Thank you and I will see you later.